Welcome to Moments with Marianne. This is your host, Marianne Pastana, and we're here today with special guest, Lindsay Roy, who's here to share with us her new book, The Gift of Perspective, Wisdom I Gained from Losing a Leg and Two Lungs. So is it possible to view your life in a more empowering way? Well, today's show is going to cover just that. At the age of 31, Lindsay Roy was named vice president at Hallmark Cards, one of the youngest in the company's more than 100-year history. Her life was abruptly transformed five years later when she was nearly killed in a boating accident. With an amputated left leg and severe limb injuries and facing a long and difficult recovery ahead, she was determined not just to heal, but to emerge stronger. So let's welcome to the show, Lindsay Roy. Thank you so much. I'm so uh, pleased to be a part of this. Well, what an honor it is to have you here to talk about this book. What a journey you have been through. And for our listeners that are new to you and your story, can you share with us the inspiration behind writing this book? So, you know, first of all, I'll say, Marianne, that we all have stories in our lives. And I am no different. I just believe through the unique paths I've traveled that by telling my stories, my hope is that I can then make purpose from my pain. And so in a nutshell, you know, those stories in my life are 10 years ago, having a leg amputation as the result of a freak boating accident. And then just a year and a half ago, being the recipient of a double lung transplant following a very rare and unexpected autoimmune disease. So through these roads less traveled, I have learned a few things that I hope to put into the world to add to our collective wisdom. And I think, you know, others should do the same because we really can learn from each other. None of us will walk the same path that we all, you know, have our own paths to walk. Well, thank you for sharing that. I know it's just interesting when we look at everyone's got their own story or their own difficulties on whatever road they're traveling. And in in many ways, it seems like, you know, you went through like the master course of <laughs> changing perspectives, because I think a lot of people might get a little stuck with everything that's happening, because that, those are some major things. They definitely were major things. And, you know, my leg amputation happened when I was 36 years old. And up until that point, you know, I had had the the garden variety challenges that, you know, a lot of people face in life, this little thing or that little thing, but I hadn't really had, you know, something that was so jarring that I had no choice but to find a greater perspective. You know, I love many quotes, but the one that a lot of people love, but it's packed with a lot of sentiment is the Robert Frost, the only way out is through. And that to me is what happens to you when you have something, like I said, a lot of us have these seismic things where your choice is, you know, to lie down by the side of the road and and feel sorry for yourself, or to find a way to kind of walk through that proverbial forest and get through to the other side. And I'll also admit, there were times in that path through the forest, you know, that I was angry or depressed or stopped and took a break. I mean, I'll be very real in our discussion here today. But I have found that you, you have to walk through. And I have discovered for my own coping mechanisms, a lot of tools that, you know, helped me walk through that metaphorical forest. So I understand you're the youngest ever named VP of Hallmark Cards. How was maintaining a job at, at, at uh, such a distinguished age, being able to manage all of this and go through all the things you went through? How was that? Well, I'll, I'll say, you know, I, I would say that I was one of them. There's a few of us over the course of over the hundred years that were about that same age, but it's still such an honor to me. And I have had, you know, a, a wonderful career at Hallmark. I've been there 23 years. And to your point, when I was just 31, I had the opportunity to become a vice president. And, you know, a story I haven't told very many people, but your thoughtful question made me think of it. And in this moment, you know, the first thing I learned to balance is the same week that I found out that I was receiving this promotion, I had found out in my personal life that I was having my first baby. And both of those things, I guess, had happened in the same week. So really from day one of that level of leadership, I was always focused on 
you know, the thing a lot of us have to think about is how are you going to balance multiple things? So I guess I got kind of an early training in that having to tell, you know, my brand new boss as I was promoted that, you know, I was, I was expecting a baby here soon. And of course he was wonderful and gracious about that. But fast forward just five years later and I left, I remember a Thursday afternoon from work with, you know, my to do's and all the stuff and getting everything organized for Monday and the things a lot of us do in our busy jobs. I had taken Friday for vacation and I was going to be returning Monday after the weekend. And that's the weekend the boating accident happened. And so from that Sunday that I ended up, you know, in the hospital from the evening events that happened the evening before until several months later, you know, my career was put on hold. And so there was a lot that came from that chapter of learning as well, to your point, kind of just trying to balance all the good things and all the all the hard things. It sounds like that was one week for celebration there, you know, finding out you're pregnant with your first child and having that type of job opportunity as well. Yeah, it was it was amazing. It was definitely one of those five star weeks. I always tell people, you know, I've logged many days uh, in the valley of one and two star days as a you know, all of us, but then it makes you even more grateful when you have those five-star days. So I love that. That was definitely a five-star week. You're right. You talk in your book about sustaining the power of your perspective. And so when we look at that, how do we manage that? Because I know a lot of times it's so easy just to focus on the horrible. It is. You're so right. And I've discovered this myself, that when something is lost or something has changed, something has taken away, or something doesn't turn out like we hope and expect or plan for, it's so easy to mourn that thing you wanted or that thing you lost. That's just human nature. And there's even a lot of science around how our brains are even wired with a negativity bias that's really the outcome of, you know, protecting yourself and adaptation and fight or flight. You know, when you see a a tiger running after you, you don't think, let me just sit here and ponder all the potential options, right? You run. <laughs> and that's how our brains are wired. And the same is true when, you know, something happens that we don't want to have happen. But I have found through things that are frankly very simple but hard to do. It's like if someone says, "Oh, I want to have a healthier lifestyle or have, you know, a, a, a body that maybe does x y or z." They might say, "Well, eat well and exercise." It's easy for me to say that. That doesn't mean it's easy for me to do that. And the same is true with perspective. I call it even perspective training. And I have found there's lots of simple things we can do. Some are things like you alluded to this, to take a moment and instead of obsess over the thing that's going wrong, to truly think of the things that are going right. It's a proverbial count your blessings, but like how often do you actually do that? And to even be okay with thinking about things that are very mundane. Like right now, you're probably sitting there and not even thinking at all how wonderful it is that you can breathe easily. As someone who spent many months on high flow oxygen, I don't take that for granted. At least I try not to. And so sometimes it's even those things that you don't often give mindfulness to. Or it can be things like, in addition to what's going right, you know, you can also take stock in how far you've come. You know, and maybe that's hard day one in the in the wake of a of a tragic situation or a difficult, you know, news that you hear. But over time, slowly but surely, there will be two star days after one star days, or five star moments after a really challenging day. And pause and reflect and think of those things. And so there's so many other things, finding, you know, hidden advantages, which are those silver linings and taking a moment to just acknowledge how resilient and resourceful you've been. And there's so many tools that I think we say we know, but what I have found is when you make yourself do them and practice them, that net result is what really allows you to sustain this idea of perspective. And I'm telling you, Marianne, it is incredibly powerful. I feel like I see the world so much differently than I did before the day of that first chapter of my accident. Well, I just have to applaud you. I mean, your story is so powerful and inspiring. I can really see how your work on the gift of perspective really helps people to change their lives. It means everything to me to hear you say that because, you know, at the end of the day, this book um, is not about me. It's about what I can do to help others. And I really do believe so many of us, and frankly, I think all of us, even if we haven't considered it yet, are ultimately satisfied when we have 
a fulfilled purpose, a sense of purpose when we're following through on what plan, you know, that was uniquely designed for us. And I feel like God had a unique plan for my life. And it helps me to think that the words that I wrote down, which were an outcome of the path that, you know, I've lived thus far, if I can help somebody, that that means everything to me. And the book is not, once again, it's not just a memoir of, okay, here's my life. It's organized into seven themes that are really about what are those buckets of wisdom that I went through with my leg journey. And then I had to kind of, you know, I was writing the book at the time. So when I got my lung diagnosis, it was life imitating art. And I had to, you know, take those lessons for myself. And then my book also includes stories of other people I've met along the way, because I've learned so much from other people. You meet a lot of interesting people on Roads Less Traveled. And I wanted to share their stories as well, because um, with their permission, I once again throw that into the bucket of our collective wisdom. Thanks to them courageously and vulnerably sharing with me, then I could wrap it all up with a bow and share it with the world. Well, I really have to applaud you because, I mean, you're so vulnerable in this book. And I love how you share how you spoke at a Forbes conference. And everyone's there talking about branding and new products. And you went in with a totally different perspective. I did. Yes, I was serving at that time as the chief marketing officer at Hallmark, which, gosh, what a privilege, you know. I mean, when you think about the amazing stories and commercials and and products and just purpose we get to be a part of at the company, I mean, that's a privilege in of itself. And I was chosen as one of the speakers of this conference, and I was talking to the people who organize these kinds of things. They were saying, yeah, our theme this year is really about vulnerability and authenticity. And I had recently, you know, just returned back to work a year or two before then, and I still, in my mind, had all of those lessons that I learned from being in a wheelchair, learning to walk on a prosthetic leg, being humbled in so many different ways. And I thought, everybody's going to tell this story that's basically going to be how they brought their brand or product or whatever to life. And I talked to the organizer and I said, hey, I learned some really hard won lessons about what it was like at work for me before when I was a little more guarded and a little bit more, hey, this is what I'm supposed to say kind of minded. And then when the accident happened, I was so vulnerable and honest and raw because I just frankly didn't worry about those things. I was on a different plane of perspective. And she said, I think that'd be amazing. And so at that point, it didn't even take courage. It was just my new normal. After I'd faced death, I wasn't worried about someone judging me for Raleigh sharing. And I stood up there and I told stories of, you know, having people have to help me slide down a portable piece of wood onto, you know, a toilet in my living room because I literally couldn't move more than two inches by myself with with three of my four limbs injured. I told stories about what it was like to try to return back to work when, you know, I could barely walk in the door and just crying alone in my office of how challenging everything was. And it was amazing. When I was done, the whole room stood up and the whole rest of the conference, people came up to me and they shared their truth with me. And I felt like I had these instant deep connections. And it was simply because I had, you know, a story and a recent story and I allowed myself to put myself out there. And it showed me so much about People just really want to be real, but someone has to get the ball rolling. And there's an instant kind of trust that's created from vulnerability. And that conference was one of my first lessons in, if I can say this kind of stuff in front of these amazingly accomplished, polished professionals, then I think you can say it in front of anyone. How empowering is that, being able to share your story in a way that, you know, you just feel so empowered doing it. And bringing that to the table, I'm sure a lot of people really resonated with what you had to say, and I could see where that would make shifts in how they manage their work going forward. It really does. And I think whether it's you as a team leader, or you as a mom, or a dad, or a community volunteer, like whatever it is your role, you're going to be surrounded by people who are not just in that role. They're not just a manager. They're not just the volunteer leader. They're a person. They have friends. They have family. They have health struggles. They have worries, whatever it is. And I've also found that, you know, this is personal to everybody. I I don't believe to be vulnerable means you have to be an oversharer. I don't think it means you have to talk all the time. Like I didn't post on social media one thing about my lung journey until after I'd had the transplant. And so I have found that being vulnerable doesn't need to be a person who, you know, has to always be out there in the spotlight, but at the right time, in the right moment, in the right way, 
allowing yourself to be vulnerable does engender a level of trust and a level of understanding and just reminds people, hey, we're all in this together. I mean, you hear the whole statement of be kind, everybody's going through stuff. But gosh, when I go sit at my daughter's volleyball practice and someone has read my book and comes up to me and says, hey, you know, I never really told anybody else here at the gym this, but I lost a child 15 years ago and and here's my story. Gosh, when I see her now, we're connected deeper than we would have been before. Or at that CMO conference you referenced earlier, the Forbes conference, I went back to my table and this guy, my same age, a young man said to me, you know, that he had lost his wife the year before to cancer. No one else in that whole conference knew that. But now that I did, we were able to have a conversation that was more meaningful than just, where are you from? You know, whatever. And I also then had enough care to know, don't ask this question or that question that probably could have been really painful for him to have to answer. And so there is just this level of vulnerability that just allows you to connect deeper and kind of cut through all the stuff and frankly, truly give grace because you know something and you're like, no wonder they're overprotective. They lost a child. No wonder he's a little quiet. He's got other things on his mind. It's just so powerful. It really, really is. Really allows you to offer more compassion for the people around you. And I could see where these really deep and meaningful connections happen. 100%. 100%. And I challenge, you know, each of you that are listening, think of what's, what's that mean to you? You know, it could be just telling yourself and admitting to yourself something that maybe is a challenge and writing it down in a journal. It could be confiding in your spouse, your best friend. It could be letting your manager at work know, hey, I'm not just taking vacation every three hours, every Friday, I'm actually having to go deal with this set of tests and I'm actually kind of scared about it. So if you don't mind, please know I've got this going on. Like whatever it is, challenge yourself to be 10%, 50%, whatever's comfortable to you, more vulnerable than you've been in the past. And I will guarantee most of you, if not all of you, will find that it really does create just an easier and more connected path. Now, earlier you alluded to these different lessons that you had learned going through these unique circumstances and these challenges that you went through. Can you share some of those with us? Yeah, let me start with the final chapter because, which is chapter seven in my book. And by the way, a little fun fact as well. When I was writing this book, I was kind of in between, you know, exactly how many chapters. And I decided that it was important for me to pick seven because the gift of life, the lung donation from my organ donor that I received was on July 7th, so 7-7, and I was born in 77. And so I thought, okay, this book is going to have seven chapters. But the seventh chapter that I'll, I'll talk to you about, one of the big lessons is this whole idea of finding a way to believe, finding a way to believe one way or another. And what I discovered is It's very difficult, going back to my Robert Frost quote, it's very difficult to be standing on the edge of a dense forest knowing you have to walk through to get to the other side when you don't believe you can. And there are many days where I did not believe that I would ever be happy again when I was sitting there in a wheelchair and couldn't move out of my living room. There were many days trying to get in my car before my lung transplant and I had to be on oxygen every second of every day and to try to get off of my oxygen machine in my house hooked up to a green tank because I needed more oxygen than those little bags that people haul around. So I had to take the green tank, trying to get that in my car and then drive somewhere and then get that out as a 40 something person. Gosh, there were many days I didn't believe, but I started to realize that if I didn't believe that I could be happy, that I could be healthy, that I could be joyful, then I didn't make any forward progress on those days. And so I started to discover there were several tactics and they bucketed around a few themes. I call them the brands of belief. The quick story, and like I said, I'll just give you kind of the the cliff notes. One of them is doing. So make yourself try something, push yourself outside of your comfort zone, do something to show yourself that maybe you can do more. One of them is seeing. Look ahead. Where's somebody else that has your same challenge? And even if they don't know it, follow them, watch them, you know, model after them and say, gosh, I can see the part of the future that I'm not to yet. Maybe if they can make it through, I can too. It'd be imagine seeing a video in the forest where you see someone popping out the other side and you think, I can do this. 
And then there's absorbing, which is to me about quotes and books and music. And just, just listen to a song over and over until you start to have that earworm make you believe. And there's two more. I think there's, you know, really five of them. One of them is asking and receiving. My family would tell me that they believed I could do X, Y, or Z on the days that I didn't think I could. And sometimes I had to beg, do you think I can do X? And it was so helpful when they did believe in me. And then last but not least, and the most important part of belief to me is trusting. You know, I learned so much about my faith and the notion of giving it to God and not just being a platitude, but something you really try to do. That brought me a lot of peace and joy and hope. And so these brands of belief, as I call them, I had so many trials and errors and so many different attempts, but by doing those things and forcing myself to kind of go through those mental motions, I would find that I could get 20, 30 more miles on kind of my belief runway, which is what I needed to keep propelling forward those darkest, shadowiest days. My goodness, I just love that. I love how you bring all that together. And what an empowering journey it is for people who read your book to be able to go, okay, I can see how this resonates with me here. I'm going to shift and really develop my gift of perspective. That's my hope. And within each of these seven chapters, you know, there's lots of different stories, like I said, from others, stories from my own life. And some of them are deep. And frankly, some of them are funny where I'm vulnerable in the almost embarrass yourself way to say, okay, here's where I failed, but here's where I learned, or here's something I did that might sound crazy, but man, I learned this from it. But wrapped up in all those stories and, you know, insights and all of that good stuff, I've loved hearing from the readers who have read my book. And each of them will come up with a different kind of collection of, man, I really thought X, Y, and Z was appropriate for my life, or this one thing I found to be so helpful, or these two things made me laugh. And it's just been so joyful. And like I said, kind of back to that purpose-driven mindset for me to hear how people have applied you know, those multiple things. Because like I said, it's all under the umbrella of perspective. Because perspective is just simply how you see things. But sometimes you have to work to change your vantage point. I love this idea of your home and how you can see that from different angles. Maybe you are in a drone and you're looking down on your home or your apartment or your flats or whatever it is. Maybe you're standing right in front of your front door on the outside, the exterior. That's a different vantage point. Maybe you're laying in your bed in your bedroom. That's a different vantage point of where you call home. And you can have a more innovative mindset. You can have a more positive mindset. You can have a problem-solving mindset. If you can find a way to see things differently, to not just be laying in your bed, but to go to that drone point of view or whatever it is. And the whole purpose of of what I try to put into the world is you got to work to find those other vantage points. But man, once every once in a while, you'll find one that everything will start to click. And you'll be able to take a step forward or solve a problem you didn't think you could solve. That's really what perspective is. It's a vantage point. And you can get stuck. You used this word earlier. You can get stuck in a vantage point. Or you can do something to get a new one. And you get a new one and everything changes. Do you feel that most people just assume that their vantage points are correct and valid and and so they just stick with that without even thinking that there could be another way of looking at things? You know, I don't know if I can get in the minds of, of most people. And I always try to believe that, you know, everybody probably has a lot going on that we don't know about. So I'll 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 leave that up to all of you. But I think what you're saying that is just so powerful, Marianne, is sometimes it's so easy and it's so human nature to be in a vantage point where You can trick yourself or frankly, just fully believe that that is the vantage point. I mean, I have done this. Oh my goodness. Uh, You know, hand in the air. Yes, I have done this where maybe it's my opinion on something where it's so hard for me to understand how someone can have an opinion that's exactly the opposite. I mean, gosh, we definitely see this in some of the divisiveness that's in the world today. And, you know, things like the social media confirmation bias. And there's so many things in our world that dig that hole a little deeper. But what do you do? Maybe you talk to somebody who thinks differently than you do that you already have respect for. 
Maybe you make yourself read news from seven different sources. And so you don't just get that one vantage point. And I think those are things you can do to practice and train how to get different vantage points and not get stuck in that one. And then I think when it's about something that you find challenging, and maybe it's just easy to say, well, from vantage point A, it's never going to work. It's never going to get better. It's never going to be solved. You can either stay there or you can say, okay, I'm going to hop over to to vantage point B, C, D, and F. And maybe, maybe just one of them, I'll see something a little different, a different color, a different, a different mode. And it's harder. It is harder to do that than to stay stuck. But man, it's a thousand times easier once you do it. You just have to do it. I think everyone goes through really dark times. What was it that helped you the most during your darkest hours? Well, I've alluded to this, but my own personal truth is my my faith was the most important thing to me. And without that, I think there are several things that I couldn't have gone through. But I also say this humbly because when I went through my leg journey 10 years ago, I thought I was a person of faith and I think I was to a degree. But if I'm being really honest to all, you know, with all of you, I I don't know that I was as faithful as I could have been. I did a lot of things that required my own grit and pulling myself up on my bootstraps and reading this book or doing that thing. And, you know, I made it through that, but it was really, really hard. And despite a a very awesome support system, I felt very alone a lot of that journey. And then when I went through this long journey, which was so much more about truly being concerned about death, the leg thing was instant accident. And then I had to learn to cope after, but the life or death thing happened within split seconds. And then after it was just living with the aftermath leading up to my lung transplant, there were many days where it would not have been surprising if I would not have made it. There was all of the fears of the surgery itself. There were so many things after the surgery. And when you get that close to your biggest fear ever, which is, you know, dying in in your mid forties with two middle school kids at home, I got to a point where I had nothing left but to truly trust God instead of myself. And that pushed me to a level that was exponentially higher in my own faith journey than in sort of my first chapter, which was my leg journey. And I just want to share that with people. And I know faith is personal and, you know, you all have to decide what it means for you. But for me, that was for sure the thing that helped me the most. And a lot of the people that I've met along the way that I reference in the book, they, and I don't, I don't talk about, you know, their faith journeys as much. I just share mostly that about myself in one of the chapters, but each one of them in their own personal way, had that part of them as well that had been honed through through their deep hardship. And so that's definitely the number one thing that helped me heal. And there were many days when I actually was peaceful and joyful when you would have looked at my circumstances and said, how in the world are you not just stuck in your bed? And it was because I trusted and it was a gift beyond comprehension. I think that's such a beautiful message, especially for this time. You know, it, it was as people are coming together and um, others are looking for for ways to be more meaningful in relationships. The relationship we have, you know, with our faith, I think, is one of the most important. It is. It is. And like I said, I know it's very personal, but I will tell you that I do believe hardship is a building season, and there's a lot of ways you can grow. And I even think that acknowledgement in and of itself helped me, and I hope it helps others. When you're in the midst of a hardship season to tell yourself, okay, life has joy seasons, hard seasons, winter, summers, whatever, whatever you want to label them. And to say, all right, it's human nature. Everybody goes through these. And I would even tell my husband that all the time, because there were a lot of people that would come up to us and say, oh my gosh, you've already been through so much. I can't believe you have to go through something else. And I would tell him, I was like, well, A, we just have a very sensational version. I say we because he had to go through everything right along beside me. We have a very sensational version and a very public version because of the nature of my stuff of problems, but that doesn't mean they're any harder. You can't compare problems. It's all relative. And I would tell him that everybody has challenges, whether you know it or not. It's human nature. It's just the, the path of life. It can be full of challenges. But in the middle of that hardship season, to tell yourself, well, this is a cycle of life. I'm in a hard season right now. There will be better seasons to come. 
And there's going to be something good that's going to come from this. Even that alone, I think, can be a bit cathartic to let yourself just acknowledge and accept that this is a season, just like you're cold in the winter. Maybe you crave the warm summer. It's just part of it. I understand you had a TEDx talk that is widely popular. I'd love for you to share a little bit about that with us. Yeah, that was born out of a kind of a funny story. So back to the hospital bed the morning after my amputation that I referenced earlier. I remember my husband was in the room. My parents had driven the many hours to find me at this hospital. The person who was driving the boat, who was my friend, uh, he and his wife were in that hospital room. And as we were all you know, there together and I was able to speak for the first time because they had I'd been intubated, so I couldn't talk. I looked at all of them and they were all just devastated looking at my highly bandaged kind of mangled body. And I said to them, and I'll tell you, Marianne, this was completely out of nowhere. I'd never thought these things. I guess it was just, you know, a little bit of shock and a lot of divine intervention where I said, you guys, don't worry. I'm going to write a book and become a professional speaker and I'll only have to work one day a month. And they all looked at me like I was absolutely crazy. But I think somewhere deep down, that was my way of saying, there's going to be some purpose from this pain. And it was, of course, in a moment of denial and shock and all of that. But over the next few years, I started to speak. It was easier for me to get out and speak than it was. The, the idea of writing a book was very daunting to me. And so I kind of pushed that further down the goal list. But I started to, dis- to speak and I would speak at, I spoke at work, I spoke at women's groups, I spoke at corporations, I spoke at a church group, I did different things. And I started to think, gosh, I would love to do a TED Talk. And what inspired that was I had been very inspired by a TED Talk myself by a woman named Amy Purdy, who was 19 years old, a snowboarder, athlete, obviously a young woman, and she contracted bacterial meningitis and had to have both of her legs amputated. She actually competed on Dancing with the Stars and has done some pretty cool things. Her TED Talk meant everything to me. And I thought, well, maybe I should try to do a TED Talk and maybe it'll help someone else. So in 2017, I did just that. And, you know, it lives out there on YouTube today, six years later. And it's fun for me to still hear from someone who just watched it, even though it's six years old. And I love the thought that, you know, five seconds or two minutes or whatever of that 17 minute TED Talk from 2017 could help somebody else. Well, I listened to your TED Talk and I found that the discussion and the, the, the talk that you brought forward was evergreen. It's something that can help people. It doesn't matter if it was done yesterday or 20 years from today. It is such a relevant piece. And I, I highly suggest people go and listen to that. Well, thank you. I appreciate that greatly. That really means a lot. You are very welcome. Well, my goodness, Lindsay, I mean, we can talk forever. Where can our listeners connect with you and learn more about your work and your book, The Gift of Perspective? Absolutely. You can find everything and links to everything on my website, which is lindsayroy.com, L-I-N-D-S-E-Y-R-O-Y.com. And you can also find my book, you know, wherever books are sold, Amazon, Barnes and Noble, et cetera. And the TED Talk is on YouTube under my name, Lindsay Roy TED Talk. So those will be some things. Or my Instagram is Lindsay Roy 26. Little fun fact also, both of my kids were born on the 26th. So, you know, that's another favorite number of mine. But I really, really appreciate this conversation. I love listening to your podcast. I think you cover such interesting topics. And it's just an honor that you asked me to join into the conversation today. So thank you so much. Well, thank you, Lindsay. It's been such an honor to have you on the show today. Make sure to pick up your copy of The Gift of Perspective, Wisdom I Gained from Losing a Leg and Two Lungs. The Gift of Perspective is available at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and all indie retailers. And remember, support our indie bookstores. Well, we're at the end of our time today. I'd like to thank everyone for tuning in. You've been listening to Moments with Marianne, where we make every moment count. In a single moment, your life can change. 
Moments with Marianne is a transformative hour that covers an endless array of topics with the best of the best. Her guests are leaders in their fields, ranging from inspirational authors, top industry leaders, and business and spiritual entrepreneurs. Each guest is gifted and a true visionary, a recognized leader in her own work, and while teaching others to develop, refocus, and grow, Marianne will bring the best guest and sometimes a special surprise. Don't miss this. You never know just which moment will change your life forever. Make sure to tune in and visit momentswithmarianne.com for more information.